So our next panel, as you know, is um, Healing Through Restorative Practices. Let me introduce our moderator, who will then introduce our panel. Uh, Courtney Bryan is the Executive Director for the Center for Justice Innovation. Before that, Courtney, a former public defender, uh, worked at the center, which was then called the Center for Court Innovation, uh, including as director of the Midtown Community Court, that's Midtown Manhattan, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, and she also worked with the Independent Commission that rec recommended the closing um, of the hellhole, otherwise known as the Rikers Island Jail uh, in New York City. Um, and at the J.P. Morgan Chase and Company Foundation, uh, Courtney helped launch the Second Chance Opportunities Initiative uh, to support greater economic opportunities for people with criminal convictions. Courtney. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, before I introduce the panel, uh, which I'm really honored to introduce, I wanted um, for us to get a sense of the room, if that's okay. So I'm going to ask uh, if you can raise your hand first. Who is a judge? Okay. Prosecutors. Defense lawyers. Oh, great. Um, community supervision, like pretrial, probation, parole. Okay. Um, Nonprofit academia. Oh, okay. A lot. Okay, great. Okay, a couple other questions. Um, who finished a case? Who's sort of been involved in a case and felt like it really wasn't finished? Like you felt like you could do more, especially if you're a judge or a prosecutor in particular, thinking you could do more for that victim or survivor. Um, that there was there were unanswered questions on the table. Um, that you wished that the person who was accused really understood the impact of their actions on the person that uh, the victim or survivor and also the community. I think a lot of people, yeah. Okay, um, and especially for those of you who've worked with people who are accused, um, uh, who have committed car harm, um, or who've adjudicated people who've committed harm, and particularly crimes of violence, um, who, saw, who saw their pain? Did anyone see their pain, the person that was accused, or their shame? A few of you. Their, their desire maybe to, to, to move forward themselves or to kind of come to peace. Um, so I, I'll say uh, our introductions, it's interesting. I think what, what we do um, often is not really the story here for who we are and how we come to this particular work. I will just really quickly say um, at the Center for Justice Innovation, we're, we're based in New York City, but we do national work um, across the country, and we got involved in uh, restorative justice through a program that we launched at the Red Hook Community Justice Center more than a decade ago that we called Peacemaking, and it was uh, based on the Navajo Nation's practice, and they actually worked with us to help train community members in Red Hook, Brooklyn, to become peacemakers and help to resolve both community-based conflicts, but also uh, crimes and conflicts that were coming into the court system. And then that practice has now kind of led to us uh, working, particularly in New York City, for how to incorporate restorative justice into the state, kind of more broadly state practice, uh, criminal legal system in New York City um, with a whole range of cases from violent um, cases, very serious cases, all the way to even lower level cases, looking for ways to incorporate restorative justice. Um, so bear with me as I, I have a, I have a, a mess of notes here, uh, in how to, <laughs> in how to do this, this panel. I was struck this morning, um, by Jeremy Travis's, for those of you who are here this morning, his sort of summation of, of what he heard yesterday. And he broke it as Jeremy does into themes, three themes. Um, one of them was what he heard yesterday, uh, and I think very much resonates with today, is the power of voice and narrative. And uh, that the voice of both redemption and the voice of pain. That is, I think you're gonna hear uh, today quite a lot about that. And then the other uh, kind of power, superpower that he referenced, and I think is, is here today as well in this panel, is the power of truth-telling. How do we reckon? Uh, both 
individually and systemically. Um, you're going to hear a lot about that today. So I'm going to offer first just sort of a quick, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, restorative justice, and we all will have different, I think, sort of definitions of it, but I'll offer just a quick framing so you can be grounded in something before introducing the panel and getting started. Um, restorative justice is a, a philosophy that's inspired by indigenous approaches to harm and conflict. Um, that really proposes that those who are impacted directly are the experts in their own experience and those that are closest to the problem and their communities should have the option to identify um, justice on their own. So it really provides a space uh, for justice that, that prioritizes genuine expressions. Um, you know, our adversarial system often doesn't allow for that. Uh, genuine expressions of remorse, active accountability, reparation of harm, the restoration of relationships. Uh, it is really a movement um, to reframe our response to harm on, again, an individual, a community, and a system level. So uh, I found that restorative justice provides opportunities for repair, for reflection, for healing, and, and with an emphasis on preventing future harm, which I think is particularly important for those of you who are in the legal system, where that's of primary um, importance, particularly for judges and prosecutors um, and community members. Um, it really is an offering, and, and there are lots of philosophies across practitioners on what the role of, of restorative justice should be in our society. I um, am proposing that it's really an offering for those who are um, whose needs are not met through our adversarial system, our traditional system. That it provides an opportunity for responsible parties who are seeking um, an opportunity to take genuine active accountability. Um, that they're seeking to move forward in their life and shed the shame. Um, and, and sort of identity that and branding often that our system imposes on, on, on people to move from sort of isolation to a sense of belonging in this society and in community. And it's also an offering for uh, victims and survivors and those impacted more broadly um, for that to have uh, answers to often unanswerable questions that certainly our, sy our system is set up, unfortunately, to not um, provide those answers. Why did this happen to me? Who is this person who committed this offense? And does this person really understand the impact of what they've done? So... Um, before we move into the panel, I just want to offer a little bit of a roadmap for where we're going to go today because there's a lot of lawyers in the room. And I know you all are just dying to understand how does this work within the system? Like, okay, okay, get to how it actually <laughs> actually works. What is the sentencing? How does it work in sentencing? How does it work um, when people mess up? What, what, what are people sentenced to? What are the legal mechanics? We're going to get there, I promise you. But we're going to start first... Um, with, I think, again, a theme from earlier today. This is people work. We call it social work because social work means, uh, or people don't want to call it social work in many ways because social work is its own profession and it, it evokes certain feelings of therapy. And But this is people work. The legal system is people work. All of you know this. All of you who are doing work, if you've been in USA your whole career, you're doing people work. Um, and so I want to start with people, with the people who are at the center of, um, of our system and center of this practice. So um, that's where we're going to first start with questions uh, for, for the panel to, to really um, help us understand how they've come to this, uh, to this work personally and professionally, and then um, what does it look like? So what does it look like in that circle, in that that thing that could be happening, you know, in a kitchen, in in a community. Um, it doesn't have to be in the legal system. But what does it look like? Then the second um, kind of uh, area is uh, how does it work within the legal system and in the process? So answering all your burning questions, all of you who are trying to figure out how does this fit within our existing legal framework, and then um, focusing on on kind of broadly uh, outcomes or impact. And, and a lot of it is going to be at, a, at an individual level, but I think there are some reflections to offer on the sort of ripple effect that we heard today, earlier this morning, the ripple effect of this practice within the system. Um, so 
Uh, to introduce the panel, uh, to my right is Stefan Thomas, who is with Common Justice, and I'm going to let you all introduce your organizations um, because you can do it more fully. Uh, former prosecutor. We have a federal judge here. Uh, judge Leo Sorokin is, uh, has been on the bench for many, many years and is also running a, a, a kind of court-based program that relies very heavily, I think, on our, uh, our panelist at the end, Clarissa. Um, Turner, who is both runs an organization, Legacy Lives On, that, that is a restorative practice organization, but also has personal experience um, as a victim of crime as well as uh, uh, benefited from the practice of restorative justice. So I'm going to start with you, Clarissa. Uh, if you can just share with us, you know, how you came to know restorative justice Again, you know, personally and professionally, we'll start there. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think you need to bring it a little closer, maybe. Is that better? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Clarissa Turner. Um, I am blessed with six beautiful children, my angels. My oldest son, Willie Marquise Turner, was killed um, in 2011. And I was introduced to restorative justice in 2012. Um, how does harm pick and choose who is to be impacted? Um, I can honestly sit here today and honestly say that now in my healing over the years, you know, I thank God for choosing me. Now, I'm not saying I thank God for my son being murdered, but I thank God that he has given me the strength, given me the guidance and the knowledge to be able to take my pain and to turn it around for such a beautiful purpose not just for myself, but for community, for the world, for my fellow sisters and my brothers, like for all of us, for we. Um, the death of my son has birthed an organization called Legacy Lives On. Legacy Lives On started off as just being a support uh, for community, um, for individuals who lost their loved ones. In the aftermath, you know, what do you do? I always say, what do you do? There's no directions, no instructions on the aftermath of a murder. So you're sitting there and you're trying to cope and deal the best way you can. And for some, when you bury your loved ones, you bury yourself. And I thank God I was one of those ones that I didn't lay down easy. But I didn't take my pain and harm. Again, I took my pain to restore, to repair. Um, just Maybe, of the organization. Yeah, say a little about the organization, then we'll, okay. yep, there's a lot that you're going to be unpacking. <laughs> so the organization, um, like I said, began as a support for community families who've been impacted by homicide, which now, God's amazing grace, have elevated and grown to something beautiful. There's a saying that, you know, um, how God can turn the ugly into uh, beauty and the bad into good, and I always question that. How is God going to turn my pain and this ugliness and this hurt into something beautiful and something good? And now I see today, just sitting here before you at this table, this is the beauty of this work. I'm still standing, I'm still here to bear witness to the testimonies of a sort of justice and how programming and new programming and how people are stepping up and stepping out to repair and not just allow harm to be suppressed because for a long, um, long time, that's what has been done. But Legacy Lives On, we're elevated and we're doing panels and we're traveling and all the good stuff, you know, we're um, educating youth. You know, we talk about the, the uh, before, the now, and the after, right? We're being able to be a part of what that truly, truly uh, looks like, being able to work with the youth in programming. And as of last year, Legacy Lives On was able to open up a program for troubled youth, first-time offenders. We go into prisons. We work with individuals who have harmed. And we allow them to see the other side. So often, you know, when things happen in the court process, you know, they don't get to see the other side. Like when you're first going for the first day, they're able to stand on the other side of the wall. They don't have to face us. That's a choice. We want to see who harmed our loved ones, but they get a choice to say, I don't want to show my face. So we don't know into sentencing, you know. Um, and then the aftermath of being able to go in and sit with individuals and really hold them accountable for what they've done. Right? Like really allowing them to share. And one thing I've learned by doing restorative justice work, which is so impactful and powerful, 
is that there is an other side and what they've been through. Now, I'm not excusing what they've been through is okay to harm us, but what they've been through, it, 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 it goes to, I hear individuals say, only if someone would have came and seen about me, only if somebody would have pulled my collar, only if I wouldn't be here today. Also, the work that we're doing with um, Judge um, Sorokin is beautiful, being able to sit in it while they're in it, you know what I'm saying, to help them to understand the other side as well, whatever that may look like for them, because we all have a story. And our story, it kind of entwines with their story, you know, so. Thank you, perfect. Thank you. Um, can I ask you, Stefan, because you also are a practitioner um, of this practice, so if you can tell how you came to this work. Um, first of all, thank you um, for having me here. My dad graduated from GW, so this is his alma mater. My parents met in DC, my sister was born here, so this kind of has, I have, I'm from the south side of Chicago, but I have some connections to DC, so it's really, really great to be here, especially because my dad passed in 2016, so he would have loved the fact that his kid was on this stage sharing about what's passionate and important to him. Um, I was a prosecutor for about a decade, and in 2012, I had a case, uh, like many folks may have had experiences at some point in time, Prosecuted individual who was mentally ill. Uh, when he was in court, he was responding to external stimuli. Uh, he had to go to Western State Hospital, our place where he could get uh, uh, filled up with a bunch of drugs so that he could be restored to sanity so that he can go to trial. I took that case to trial. Uh, I won the case. Uh, when he came, it was an assault case. When he came in, he was homeless, uh, was living under a bridge, had an alcohol problem. Uh, I, did, I was a great trial attorney. <laughs> and um, I think most trial attorneys like to toot their horn a little bit. And, um, you know, he got convicted. Uh, and he had spent so much time in jail pre-trial that he was pretty much immediate released right back onto the street. Um, two months later, he was in a Burger King, walked up to a random person, took out a knife and stabbed them in the neck. And the homicide unit at my office called me on the phone uh, after that happened, and I'm like, oh my God, I'm about to get fired. Uh, and the only thing that they wanted to know from me is, did I ask for the highest sentence possible? That was the only question. Not did I try to get this person who was mentally ill and homeless any support or any services or anything to wrap something around him um, so that he wouldn't commit the harm that he caused just a couple months later. And after that incident, you know, I really became obsessed with the fact, like, what are we going to do other than what I have been doing because it's ineffective, it's not working, it's expensive, it's certainly not helping the survivors. What are the other options out there? And I became obsessed with that question because that was what my community was demanding. That's what my heart, my soul, my spirit was asking me those questions, and that is what led me to start asking questions about restorative justice. And with a team of folks in my office, we started, a, 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 this was in 2012, a, a pre-trial diversion program for juveniles, which we thought was like the hottest stuff possible, right? It was like so dope. We were, we were like diverting pre-trial. They didn't even got into the system. They never had a record. But it was like thefts and assaults and marijuana possession, like things I did when I was a kid things that maybe didn't even need to be in the criminal justice system in the first place. But at that time, it was innovative, it was groundbreaking. But once we start doing that and you get a little bit of success, you start, well, shoot, if we can do this for a theft case, like why not for an assault? Why not for a gun possession? Why not for a robbery? Why not for more serious and serious and serious cases? And when you begin to ask that question, at some point in time, you're gonna end up at this organization called Common Justice. And that's where I went in 2017, like bright eyed, like ready to like, like demand from Danielle Serrett that she's gonna come to Seattle, which is where I was practicing at the time, and they were gonna bring common justice to Seattle. And she looked at me and very kind and said, no, I'll pass on that one. But we stayed friends, we stayed connected because we're both, from the, we're both from Chicago and we both grew up drinking Lake Michigan water and so there's a connection that we had and so we remained friends. And, uh, and after I left the DA's office, um, she asked me if I would come to work for Common Justice because now they had the capacity 
or where they were going to start open up their playbook and open up the insights and the wisdom and the lessons that they had learned through a lot of mistakes, give you, uh, mind you. Um, and they were going to start uh, doing training and capacity building and that they were going to replicate not their work, not like franchise common justice, but the values uh, that we have been practicing for the last 15 years. So common justice is based in Brooklyn, New York, originally based in Brooklyn, right now in Brooklyn, Manhattan, and the Bronx. Uh, and we divert cases of serious violence, things like attempted murder, uh, uh, robbery at gunpoint, uh, stabbing cases, uh, really, really serious violence. It's a really intense process, which I will go through probably at a little bit later time. At the, uh, and we also, it's important, uh, we also provide a Cadillac of services to survivors as well. Uh, folks only get into our process if the survivor consent, and 90% of the survivors that we work with say yes. 70% of our survivors are young men of color, which is absolutely unheard of because there's a bis mixed nomer that most victims are, excuse me, but Becky running in the park late at night and she gets pounced on by a group of predators. That's just not the reality. If you've been in the system for a while, you know that's not the reality and that there's a lot of young people, especially young men, who do not get access, do not get the claim that they are survivors, we reach those folks and we give them whatever they need to heal and to be able to transform and uh, alchemize what happened to them. So I'm sure we'll go into more details about it, but that's kind of a little bit of a picture of how I came to this work, what, what I do now and what common justice is. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Sorokin. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> first, I want to really thank Clarissa and um, a number of compatriots of Clarissa who, uh, like Clarissa, have endured unfathomable hardship and harm and found a way to turn it into healing and beauty and um, grace because the real reason I'm here is because of them. Uh, first of all, we wouldn't have anything but for them. Uh, we wouldn't have a program. We wouldn't have anything. And so the, the reason I'm here in one sense is because of them. And um, But more importantly, the reason I'm here is because um, the work that they do and that um, um, I've always thought um, that the world can be a better place than it is. <clears throat> I'm one of those people, if I were asking you to raise your, the question I might be asking you to raise your hands to is all of you think that the work you do as judges or prosecutors or defense attorneys or probation officers or academics or whatever it is you do, are you satisfied that you're doing it really well, mm. perfectly? And if you are, I would tell you then you should go out. It's a pretty nice day in D.C. <laughs> and enjoy yourself and pat yourself on the back. And if you're not, then there's something to talk about. I've never been able to raise my hand to that question because I've always thought that I could do better and I've always thought that the people around me could do better and, um, and never believed that we should accept that things are the way they are just because they are the way they are, that there has to be a reason. Um, my willingness to question or challenge those things, which at times can be annoying to some people, um, is not my fault. I, that's my parents' fault. They told me this. They injected that into me day in and day out in my childhood. Um, and so uh, if anyone's to blame for that, it's them. Um, and so what brought me, that's what has brought me here. It's because um, uh, in 2000, what brought me to restorative justice, of which I knew nothing, was in 2007, I went to a conference sponsored by the Sentencing Commission um, uh, about alternatives to sentencing, and there were two people who presented there about restorative justice. One who talked about a case that she had as a public defender where some skinheads had defaced a, a Jewish temple and um, with swastikas and Nazi symbols, and many of the members of the temple were survivors of the Holocaust. And um, one of the three perpetrators of this crime was interested in doing a restorative justice process, and he engaged in a lengthy, year-long process, some on his own, some with a, they had a facilitator, and, and some with a committee from the, of representatives of the membership of the temple. And another was a woman who spoke about a program she had in the San Francisco jail, which was aimed at, was essentially a therapeutic community aimed at 
um, reducing violence against women. And what really stuck with me was a story she told when um, the grandmother of a, a, a woman who came whose daughter and granddaughter were brutally murdered in a horrific um, crime in California. When she, she uh, the woman who ran this program brought that uh, woman in to speak with the men in the jail. And what struck me was how her description that that woman bonded so well with the men in the jail. And what they bonded over was almost everybody in the jail also had a close friend, family member who'd been murdered or violently assaulted. And they all shared that experience. And so they, they felt her pain um, and connected with her. And I left that thinking there's something dramatically missing from what we're doing in federal court. I was then a U.S. magistrate judge. I'd been a federal public defender before then. And it's that dimension of healing and humanity. Um, and so I set on a process to try to learn about restorative justice and went to some circle training with a group outside Boston. And um, eventually we started a program that we have now at the court, which we'll talk more about later, but in summary part has two, part, two different components to it. One is a program called RISE, which is for people who are on pretrial release, and they can do various treatment programs. It's not that different than a lot of programs in the federal system, except that if you do it, you have to do restorative justice. And then the other part, more recently, we started a pilot program at one of our detention facilities taking our just restorative justice program out of RISE and offering it to um, people in the detention facility. And what I would say, in my experience, and there's at least one or maybe several people from Boston here, so they'll have the chance to comment if they think otherwise, but in my experience, um, the judges love it. And why does it speak to the judges? Because if you're a judge, the idea that people are taking responsibility and accountability for what they've done and appreciating the harm they've caused, that's music to your ears because that's what you're hoping for for people who've done that. And that, um, uh, that people who've been harmed by crime are having an opportunity to heal, that they're having an opportunity to participate in the process, that they're getting questions answered, not questions like sitting at a deposition, walking into a circle, and in the first minute saying, okay, what about this, sir, and what about that and that, and then when I'm done with my 10 or 12 questions, see ya. But opportunities to engage in a process through which you will receive answers to like some of the questions that Clarissa mentioned. And, um, and that you'll come to know this person, that they find it helpful. That, uh, not Clarissa, but another mom, who said to me after she participated in one of our circles, she said that now she had something, she said she was anticipating meeting monsters. And um, because only monsters would um, do what had been done to her son who died of a drug overdose, but sell of drugs to a drug addict. And she said, but now I have something to take home to my daughter who's in a difficult and dark place at home that will help her, her after her brother had died. And I thought as a judge, if that's the only thing we ever accomplish, then the whole thing is worth it. Because we've helped that person and, um, and we're doing much more than that. But that's, that's enough. If that were all it was, that would be enough. And um, so um, the defendants who participate, those who succeed, speak of it as a like, transformative experience and they become connected with other human beings in an ongoing way. And, and that's a positive thing. And we see positive results from that change. And the prosecutors who participate in it, the prosecutors who've had cases with it, I think they're, they, they're a range, like everybody. They have a range of views, but some are very enthusiastic and, and really love it. And the, the degree that they endorse it, to some degree, in my observation, depends on their degree of participation. Those who've sat for two days in a circle, um, one of our circles, are very powerful supporters of this process. Those who know very little about it generally view it as either hug-a-thug. Of course, my, you know what my response to hug-a-thug is? If you could tell me that hugging a thug would mean that he wouldn't sell fentanyl to uh, parents or children, that he wouldn't rob a bank or that he wouldn't um, commit a violent crime, then I would absolutely hug him. Like... <laughs> like, I would be wondering, why won't you hug him? And, um, so I don't do that because I don't know that I don't have any reason to think that that would do it. Um, uh, 
but some some view it that way, and that's fair, and they're entitled to their perspective on it. And I think, but what I think it really reflects is a dispute about two things. One is what weight to give it at sentencing. Um, it, it's a dispute about is it real, the, the transformation change that we're talking about. It's a fair question. Mm. And is it what weight to give it? That is, how, mu how significant should be in the mix of all the things that a judge considers at sentencing? And my own at least in our program perspective on that, is that it depends on the facts and circumstances of the case in the person. It can have massive and huge significance or very little <coughs> significance, depending on a lot of factors, including how much change you see from the person. And the other part is it's, uh, it reflects the, the discomfort and, or the challenges and turbulence that arise um, in the course of possible change. Because this is no question that this is a different approach, and it makes you think differently about the purpose of the criminal justice system. And I say to people often, there's a difference between being tough on crime and tough on criminals. We're certainly tough on criminals. Um, but what, what people in the community expect from us in the system, we are public servants after all who work for the taxpayers, who pay our, at least those of us who are judges, prosecutors or public defenders and probation officers, which is most of the people in the system, um, they expect us to solve problems. Mm. And so that what they want is that their neighborhoods are safe. They want to be able to walk outside their houses and not be attacked. They don't want to worry about their things in their apartment. Then they send their kids to school. They don't want to worry about what happens to them. So the metric is public safety, which isn't to say, just to say, of course, prosecution's appropriate in many cases, and so is prison in many cases. But the metric isn't for success isn't how many convictions or how much jail time or how many times I'm not reversed. The metric, I mean, those are important in the sort of narrow metrics, but what people really want to know is that their community is safe. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, I'll, that is, um, I think, the measure. And of course, the challenge of doing that is rewarding. And it's why, and then I'll shut up, I don't like the title of this conference, which is it's the criminal legal system uh, with something on the uh, banner this morning and during the panel this morning. Well, I don't think it's the criminal legal system. It's the criminal justice system. It may not always be just, but it's supposed to be just. And I'm aspiring to justice, and I hope everybody who walks into every courtroom is aspiring to accomplish justice under the law, because that's what we should be doing. We might not always do it. I don't feel like we've done it perfectly. There's much to consider and evaluate in our historical record of our country and even in the present day. But justice is what we're aspiring to. And so that's why I disagree with that title and wish it said criminal justice system because we should be aspiring to justice. Um, thank you. Great. Thank you. I'm going to have you talk to all of my staff who are under 25 <laughs> to, ex to, ex to explain that, that view. Um, uh, Stefan, I want to turn to you next. Um, you're going to hear in a minute from, uh, I think, the practitioners from Stefan and, and Clarissa on what it looks like in the room. Like, okay, what is this? What does it look like in the room? But I want to ask you first, um, I offered a sort of broad definition of what restorative justice is. Is, you know, thinking, so you're going to hear a few models. We also practice a different kind of model at the center. What are some of the sort of foundational principles and values that you think sort of transcend, you know, any uh, technique or any kind of way of delivering restorative justice? Yeah, I mean, um, two things come to mind. One is uh, survivor centeredness and accountability. And I'll talk about both of those. Um, when I was a prosecutor, I had this really candid conversation with one of my colleagues who said that if his child was ever sexually assaulted, that he would never want them to go through the criminal legal system. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> through the criminal justice system. And I think it was a recognition on his part that this process does not work very well for survivors. Um, I, mean, how, I mean, can you imagine, like, you have been uh, harmed in some type of way. Someone has taken advantage of you in some type of way, and you have to sit in that wooden box, and someone, is, someone who's really skillful is going to ask you these really pointed questions to try to point out the discrepancies in the facts that you are saying. And that's only the small percentage of cases that actually go to trial. The vast majority of them we know don't, and they resolve in a plea. And maybe you'll get to like say a piece at your sentencing. But you really don't get to actually dictate what does healing from this harm look, for me, look like for me. 
and in, in our process, like that really is what gets to happen. Like survivors, I think the research is really, really clear, have such a deep sense of satisfaction going through restorative justice, and they really just don't say that about the criminal justice system. They absolutely do not, uh, because it's not really designed uh, for them to have healing and transformation. But when it comes to restorative justice, like that is the goal. Um, and that is why, for a lot of reasons, but that's why 90% of the people who we offer this option to, uh, they choose this one. Uh, and it's because they get to have a say-so in what does healing look like for me. They get to ask the questions that they really want to know. Why did you do this? What were you thinking at the time? Why me? Who the hell are you and where do you come from and where are your people from? Like they get to ask these really deep, deep and pointed questions and they get to feel a sense of satisfaction and ownership. When you are a victim of violent crime, like there's a power thing that gets taken away from you. And when you get into the driver's seat of justice, like you get that power back. And that is really, really transformational for that individual person. So first is the survivor-centeredness of it. Uh, the second thing is around accountability. You know, we say a lot, we like conflate these two terms of accountability and punishment, and we make it to be the same thing. Uh, and at Common Justice, we like to say like those things are not even the same, they're actually diametrically opposed to one another. Like punishment is really passive. Like all you have to do is be punished is just like not escape, uh, which they do a really good job of when they put you in those handcuffs and put you in that little cage. And so punishment, um, I mean, you can, I mean, I was also a defense attorney for a period of time. Um, and so how many clients, like, who really, like, man, I fucking did this shit, uh, excuse me, uh, but they know that they did it. And the first thing that I'm going to tell you is, like, shut up, don't speak, I'm going to do all the speaking for you, we're going to fight this case. I don't care if you did it or not. Like, there's no place of having to take ownership or responsibility over what you did. And how many people, I've spent a lot of times in prison, uh, people who still, like just because you're in prison, it's not like you have to go through some type of accountability process or taking responsibility. You can literally sit in those cages and watch television all day long and not give a flip about the person or the community that you actually cause harm to. Like that is the reality. What happens with far too many people. But in our process, like people have to really reckon with the fact of the harm that they did to themselves, that they did to the survivor, that they did to their community, that person's family, the whole ecosystem. They have to understand the systemic and the contextual reasons for why they were in the place that what they were in and the decisions that they made. They have to really understand and take account for all of those things. Like some of the core features of accountability are one, taking that ownership, one, feeling a sense of remorse about what you did. Like, yeah, I mean, you ever get it? I mean, how many judges have you, or prosecutors or defense attorneys, you, you're at that sentencing and the, play, and the person is so mad at the fact that they're there. They have no desire to take any responsibility or accountability for what they did. No sense of remorse. They're just angry, right? In our process, people, and we only work with folks who are willing to take that sense of responsibility, you feel a genuine sense of remorse, and then you do the work of what you need to do to repair the harm that you have caused. And at its best, it's driven by the wishes, desires, and needs of the survivor. And then finally, to really be held accountable, you're the type of person, you become the type of person who never causes that type of harm again. Like that, that in our definition, is true, true accountability. That if you are a person that was out there robbing and stealing and cheating in order to survive, in order to make a living, that you put that down and you are headed in a different direction. Like that should be the desire of all of us. I mean, that to me is like true sense of justice. And if we're not getting that, if we're not achieving that goal, then we need to be asking some questions about what are the options are out there. So those are two features. Thank you. And can I just ask you, and then I'm going to ask you, Clarissa, um, tell, tell, the, tell us about what that, what, take us in the room, you know, put us in the room. What is it, what does it look like to do that process um, that you're describing in, in more detail? And then Clarissa, I'll ask you the same. Um, I'll just kind of explain how common justice works yep. a little bit. Yep. I think Great. that might be helpful. Yep. Um, so our process, um, 
we get cases that are diverted to us from the DA's office. Uh, they have to meet a certain set of criteria. Uh, we work with folks who are ages 16 to 26 uh, who are charged with serious violent offenses that are non-sex cases and non-DV cases. Um, the person uh, who, who comes into our process cannot have a serious mental health issue uh, or a serious substance abuse issue. Doesn't mean that you can't use drugs, but like people who are like full-blown addicts, and the reason why is because some of the concepts that we're gonna work, be working with folks through uh, are really difficult, uh, and we're not experts in being able to walk people through healing from addiction uh, to that extent. Um, there's a pretty intense vetting process that we go through um, we only take cases that are post-indictment, uh, and we really only start our intervention um, with what we call responsible parties after the survivor has consented to it and after the person has taken a plea. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons why we do our process post-plea. Uh, I've written a whole paper on it. If you're interested in reading about it at some point in time, I really nerd out on this stuff because there's a lot of different points in the system where you could intervene and we have situated us post-indictment and post-plea. And, and the big reason for that is if we really want to be survivor-centered, we do not want to have a process that someone can goes through and if the responsible party fails, that that survivor then has to go back to trial again. Like it's really important to them that the case is resolved and they never have to worry about that case again. Uh, especially on cases of serious violence. Uh, our process is 12 to 15 months uh, to get from the place where you are entered into common justice to a place where you, um, your case is dismissed or dropped down to a misdemeanor or a violation. Uh, and during that time, the first part of it is uh, we're meeting one-on-one -on -one, uh, with our responsible parties. And let me just say really quickly, our survivors have their own process as well. Uh, of course, they're not court mandated to be with us, and so they get to choose how much they want to connect with what we call our trauma support team. It's all up to them. Some people uh, uh, really, really want a lot of uh, support and help, and other people really don't. Uh, for our responsible parties, um, we are meeting with them at the beginning of our process five days a week. Uh, they are also required uh, to do 20 hours of some type of other activity, whether it be like engaged in job, education, child care. Uh, they also do once a week a, a gender-based cohort. Um, so they're meeting with other people in a small group, other folks who are engaged uh, in our process. And one day of those five days, we're also talking just about stability issues. So that's looking at things like housing, uh, health care, jobs, so on and so forth. And we have people on our team who are skillful at connecting people with what they need in order to move through, uh, in order to stabilize their lives. After a period of time when we feel like the person's ready, uh, we bring them together with the person uh, that they have harmed um, to have a face-to-face -face conversation. Uh, and that's really an opportunity for uh, the survivor to be able to say, to ask the questions that they ask, but also to say what they need in order to move on from this process. Uh, and some of it could be like, you know, sometimes people are, are assaulted or are beat up by multiple different people. I'm just thinking about a case that we had not that long ago where only one of the three co-defendants got arrested. And so the ask of the survivor was, I need you to bring these other people in here and tell them don't mess with me in my neighborhood. Like that was a huge thing because the police were not gonna be able to do that. They didn't have any power to do that. But that person who got arrested and charged had some sway on the streets. And so he was able to tell his little homies, look, you need to back off and back down and give this person a pass in his neighborhood. It's not a snitch, so on and so forth. So it looks like them really being able to get what they need to really feel safe again. Uh, af we also take people through a really intense and violence intervention curriculum uh, that looks not only at the context for which they live in, but things around their own personal trauma, their own experience with violence, uh, their family ecosystem, uh, really digging into the reasons why they got into that process in the first place, into that um, committing that type of harm in the first place. Uh, and then after a period of time, they also uh, are required uh, every month to go before the court and give updates. So it's like this post plea, the sentencing's kicked out for a period of time for the lawyers in the room. Um, so that's continued for a period of time where they're kind of engaged in our process. 
but they have to give monthly updates to the court. Uh, so our team goes in with our responsible parties uh, and we update the court on what their progress is. Um, and we have found that that is both a motivating factor for our responsible parties and something that also terrorized the heck out of them uh, because they know that if they are not successful, and I don't think I mentioned that, we only work with people who are headed to prison. Um, so we are an alternative to prison. So the people who are engaged in our process have to be facing a year or more of time. Uh, if they are not, we don't work with them. Um, and, the, and, and that's just the narrow lane of the slice of the pie that we have decided to work through. Uh, we did not want to be an alternative to dismissal, uh, which is another reason why we work at cases in this post-plea stage. We do a little vetting of the case to make sure it's an actual viable real case. Um, so we serve as an alternative to prison. Um, while at the beginning it's super motivating for our responsible parties to go before the court uh, because they're scared of that, pr of that prison term, our goal is to move them from an extrinsic motivator to an intrinsic motivation, where they are doing this because they, they are doing this and wanting to heal this harm because this is who they are and that's the type of person that they have become. Um, the numbers that we have are like, are, they're just really successful. Since 2012, when we finalized our model out of a few hundred folks, uh, we've had one person go out and commit another violent crime. 7% uh, of the people who go through our process get terminated for committing a new offense. This means like while they're in the process, they get terminated. Uh, it's not all about the results, um, but they do matter. And I know people in here like to have numbers and statistics and data and all that kind of stuff. I would love, if there's anyone in this room who, I would, I would uh, love to debate anyone in this room who thinks that their numbers and outcomes are better than the ones that we have. The reality is like, it just doesn't. Like our survivors are more satisfied, our responsible partners are getting the tools they need to be able to move through. Um, and it's, and I would say this, and I'll end with this, because I was a prosecutor, um, the satisfaction that the DAs who work on these cases have around their work, right? A lot of the work that we do sometimes can be super depressing. And the outcomes you have, even when you win that case and it's great and it's wonderful and it's amazing, someone's going to prison. And so there has to be a part of you, right? It's like, dang, yeah, like I'm glad that I, I, I won, but at the same time, this person's going to prison for a long time. You know, the sense of satisfaction that you feel of, man, being a part of this ecosystem where people are really getting what they need. The, 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 you know, when I first went to Brooklyn in 2017 to visit Common Justice, I went to the Brooklyn DA's office, met with like, you know, like cut from the cloth law and order prosecutor. You know what I mean? Been doing, it's like he tried all the big cases, you know, like just the toughest of the toughest kind of prosecutor. But he was the one who reviewed a lot of our cases to get diverted. And he just like sat back and he was like, excuse my language, he's like, this shit works. Like, this shit works. Like, it's better for our survivors. Our responsible parties aren't coming back again and again and again. Like, this just works. And I feel better doing my job when I get to actually feel like I'm making a difference and I'm actually doing justice. And I was like, that's all I needed to hear. That was awesome. So. That's a serious drop the mic moment. And I know exactly who that prosecutor is. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm going to ask Clarissa, if you can just talk about what you do in the room, like put us in a circle, and then Judge Sorokin, you can kind of do essentially the program, you know, like all of the legal components in detail, but Clarissa, and, and you're, um, in, in, if I can make this distinction a bit, if I understand it right, is um, Stefan, common justice is about putting the victim of the crime, the survivor of the crime, with the responsible party together. And... Um, the model that um, Clarissa uses is is what we would call a surrogate model, which is that you have people who, like Clarissa and others, who are who are sort of representing um, the survivor victim affected party. Um, there may be some others. Sometimes we have okay. to do that. You do. Well. Sometimes yeah. you do. Right when the okay, okay. So a victim may consent to it, but doesn't feel comfortable yeah, being in the room. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, just and and please correct me, Clarissa, where that isn't the case. But I just wanted to make that um, clear that there. That's another way to kind of exercise this. So do you want to talk uh, about? Oh, I'm sorry, Judge. 
<laughs> okay. So I just, just to, the use of the term surrogate, and so what, in our program, which I'll talk more about after Clarissa goes, I just want to clarify this. Most of the crimes that we, most of the crimes committed by the participants in our various restorative justice program have no under federal law identifiable, no actual quote victim, either because it's legally quote unquote victimless, like drug dealing. It's not a victimless crime, but legally there's no identifiable victim. And so we, for many, so that's true for many of the offenses committed by the, per, the defendants who participate in our program. So in those circumstances, we use people who've been victims of crimes similar in nature, and we call their surrogate victims is the term. I, the reason I was just chatting with Clarissa and clarifying is, and Clarissa participates in our program in that way, but that's not the only work Clarissa has done right. in restorative justice. And mm -hmm. she has, I think, participated in uh, restorative justice as well as not a surrogate victim, but as the affected harm. party. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. So, yes, I wanted to share also um, in this work that we do, we wear many hats. Like you said, it's not just sitting and surrogate for, um, like, really being able to hold accountable, even outside within the community with the gang members, the youth, even sitting with uh, leaders of gangs in regards to what the value of life really looks like, right? And also being able to hear their side. I've learned there's always another side, their side. And not oftentimes people want to hear their side. People just look at the act of the action that they are committing. But we've learned, I've learned and shared to step outside of myself, my shoes, and allow myself to step in their shoes. And when I'm listening, listening, I listen with an open heart. And being able to have empathy and compassion for them. And it's one thing to tell somebody something, but it's another for a person to feel it, to see it, and to know that it's truly genuine. Um, this year, March 28th, I had the opportunity to sit with one of the young men that killed my son. Um, and, you know, when my, fun, when my son's um, life was first taken, and within the two years going into court, I remember um, facing the two gentlemen and I told them I forgave them and I meant it. It wasn't an act, it wasn't for cameras, it wasn't for show. Due to my religion, uh, God being ahead of my life, a true Christian, and my mother, my grandmother's upbringing, I knew what I needed to do. I didn't understand it, but I knew I needed to forgive them. And when I told them both I forgave them, the courtroom was at a ray because, you know, first thing, you know, people have their thought, thoughts of this is all an act or, you know, um, this is a show. And the um, district attorney, um, before I took the stand, had already told the parents and told the court that uh, Willie Marquis Turner mom is going to do an impact statement and what she's going to say you may not like to hear, you know. To be honest, he attacked me and my character and never knew me, didn't even know my son. Um, so when I said I forgave them, it turned everything around within the courtroom that afterwards he had to take the stand and he said that he apologized to me for what he said. And that meant a lot. And he also added that within the statement of the um, newspaper. That meant a lot to me because when things like this happen, you're automatically attacked. And I feel like we so busy in this world judging or casting judgment on someone else, but we don't really take time to learn the story or see the picture um, for what it uh, truly is. Um, a year after, I wrote the two gentlemen a letter um, letting them know I forgave them because I wanted to make sure that they heard me clearly and they understood it was sincere, it was real. And I also gave an introduction to them of what forgiveness was and what it is to me and what it does uh, mean to me. And I also I added about their families and their parents and how I saw their mothers in the courtroom, how their moms were broken and hurt. And that was my beginning stage of holding them accountable. Because nine out of ten, when you leave the courtroom, you suppress what you do and you go do your time and you get out. And that was my question. How are individuals going to court doing their given time and going and do their time, and then they come out and compute, do these acts again and again and again and again. How is this? And I hear programs in the system, but it's like impactfully, like for me, when I speak or when I do something, 
I want to be a seed. Something I say I wanted to be a seed that plant within someone and grow. That once they leave my presence, whichever way they choose to go, they make a decision that's on them. And praying that they make the right decision. I'll say February, the process began for me to meet this gentleman. And, you know, they have the victim advocate. They go back and forth. They meet with him. They meet with me. This happened several times. And before we met, he wanted to write me a letter. And I bought the letter, and it's in my bag downstairs. And I'm like, ugh. Because that letter is so powerful, and it speaks restorative justice. And for someone who was broken in such a way, we had the opportunity to have conversation. And I asked them if I can bring an Uno card. You know, youth, they love playing Uno. They love games. And I wanted something that can make him comfortable so he wouldn't be, you know, in an awkward um, sitting uh, situation of his energy, and I asked him if we can break bread. A breaking bread is a big thing for me, you know, when you eat with them. And um, the um, prison allowed it. So when he came in, I asked the um, staff to stand to the side. I wanted to see where he sat because where he sat was showing me where he was in his uh, process. And he came and sat right in front of me. That meant everything to me. But he was nervous. He was shaking. So. Never say what you won't do. Because I remember saying when everything happened, I, I, I could never sit with the individual that harmed my son. I could never be close to them. I could never touch them. I didn't want to see them. But when he sat down before me, I saw a little boy. I saw a human being. And I extended my hands. And he put his hands in my hands, and I squeezed his hand. And I centered him as well as I was centering myself. And I said, breathe. We did three breathing exercises, and I let his hand go, and he sat back in the chair. And you could see his whole, everything was just getting comfortable. And I didn't want to hear what they did to my son, because I already heard it from the streets, and I didn't, I wasn't comfortable. And I told the, act, um, the witness advocate to let him know that, that he don't have to revisit that. But he felt he need to just tell me what happened, and he shared what happened to my son. My son had came out. Through the project, he was walking through. His girlfriend had just moved into their first apartment. And as my son walked through, he looked to the left, and it was three gentlemen standing to the left. And one of the individuals asked him, excuse my French, what the F you looking at? Mm. My son responded, what the F you looking at? They had words, and my son walked away, and one of the gentlemen walked up from behind and shot him in the back of the head. He wanted me to know how sorry he was and he, I'm sorry. This is not just emotions of pain, it's emotions of how powerful restorative justice work is and how impactful it is and how it has made change in individuals. You know, we look at what they've done and we really get locked in the act of the action of that individual. But when you really sit and do these processes with them, and you, like, for me, him knowing, I see you, I hear you, you matter, you were loved. Him sharing that, he never had that. He come from a family of six. His mother was a single parent. They lived in the projects. His mother working three jobs. And her night job was a job when they would sneak out the house. And how the elders in the projects would come and see about them. Right? They would take care of them. They would feed them and clothe them. That opened doors for them to be trained, as he say, to become killers. He has four brothers, well, four of them and two sisters, and all four of his brothers are murderers. They've killed. And so when I spoke about the three gentlemen, it was him and his brother with the individual that killed my son. His brother didn't get charged for my son's murder because he was already being charged for another murder. So he just shared his pain and like he just wanted to release. We talk about how things happen in our world that we suppress, we suppress, we suppress, we suppress. And these are the individuals that we're working with, right? They're suppressing and suppressing. Okay, you get two years, you get three years. Okay, they go to jail. They're suppressing, they're suppressing, they're suppressing, and the cup is running over. And finally, when the cup runs over, whoever's in that raft of area gets it, because that's what happened to my son. He expressed that days before that he got into a shootout with another gang, and he almost lost his life. And how he was angry. 
He was paranoid. He was mad. Somebody had to pay. And I posed the question, if it wasn't my son, would it have been someone else? And he said, yes. That bothered me. Yes. So because you're angry at something you had no control over, you're going to harm people because you're angry? Now you are opposing pain on me and my family. And how many times has happened that families are being stricken with the pain of somebody else? What does that look like? Oh, yes, I have to do something about this. And for me, I thank God it was restorative justice. Because I take, I work, and I tell people I work from my pain. And I love what I do. Because it helps build structure within individuals who never had it, who don't know what it is. We talk about values. What are values? You ask people, when I was first asked, I lived by them, but I didn't know what values truly was. I didn't know how to be. And then there's so much that comes in tell with the aftermath of, well, I'll say before stage, of being home. You know, we're so quick to say, well, only if the parents would have, or oh, this starts at home. Yeah, it starts at home, but also education-wise. Like, I sit with parents now who are broken, who have been through what I've been through years, who lost loved ones or drug addiction or rape, whatever it may be, and it was never dealt with. So now that's pain on top of other pain, on top of other pain. And then you're having children into pain. So this pain is just continuing over and over and over and over again. And who was getting the wrath of this pain? We are, I did, I am. It's not okay that these harms have became and have become a norm in our everyday life of existence. That when someone's getting murdered, straight on Facebook, check your loved ones, check your community, you're getting texts and pages and emails about Oh, don't your people live in this neighborhood? Something. No, it, it's not okay for the normalcy of harm to repeat itself. So I, Legacy Lives On, stand and we intercede for individuals who are broken and who are harmed, who need and want, sometimes they want to be held accountable. Mm. Mm -hmm. But we the people afraid of the outcome, what that's going to look like. So for me, I done lost my son. So whatever you got, bring it. Right? Because I'm going to do my work. I'm going to make sure you understand that that act that you have committed cannot repeat itself again. And I thank God for the opportunity in RISE that when they're charged with a crime and waiting for sentencing, we get to sit in circle with them. And we get to sit as a surrogate for them. And never be able to, like, to go into the jails in the aftermath. These men are coming back home. So I don't want to allow them when I go in, the opportunity to allow them to suppress what they've done. They need to be held accountable. They need to feel, they need to understand that this harm cannot come back outside. And I will say, it's been impactful. A lot of men who are released now have come out and they got their own programs. They um, partner up with myself. We do work within the community with the youth. But just to get back real quick with Prince Dennis, um, Prince Dennis was sent to uh, Norfolk prison. And Norfolk is a restorative justice prison. And the men from us doing this work, they know the work that I do. And when he went into Norfolk prison, they circled up around this young man. And they really, really did a lot of work with him around restorative justice. They really held him accountable for his act, but they did it in a safe way, mm -hmm. in a loving way. That when we met, he was able to say how he was really embraced and how sorry he was for what he's done, how when he comes out, he wants to work with me. He wants to repair the harm that he has opposed upon community. And I told him I would love to work with him. And my other kids are like, Ma, you're crazy. But this is the work. Sometimes you got to get uncomfortable to get comfortable. And I'm already uncomfortable because my son is long over here. But if I can really stand side by side with him and do work in our community, and we both be on the panel, and one day y'all may be in the audience and be like, there they go. It may truly happen that we both can really, really hit on topics of this work, what we've been through, because they all have a story. We just have to be open to listen to it. And Judge Sirocco, I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for seeing Legacy Lives On, us mothers, as a partner of the work that we do, because not oftentimes are victims at it. 
to these tables are added to be a part of a process of healing and repairing harm. And this is a great opportunity that, and, and I know you've met quite a few of them who, when we give, we give fully for this work. We give fully to build a safe haven in our communities around the world. These men do want to hear from us and they always, like they'll tell you, you're like my mother, you're like my sister, my grandmother. They've been locked up 15, 20, 30 years. To see and to hear from us is like a reconnection, a rebirth for them that now they can begin their healing process. So when they do come home, they heal and don't hurt. They repair and not break. So, and it's like I said, so we had to, we do these talks, right? There's so much in here that I wanna share that is locked up in a time limit. So I may be like hopping from this to that to there. I'm just trying to get the pieces out as much as I can of importance of the um, program that is being ran and of this restorative justice work. And us just being able to sometime in our positions, sometimes you gotta put your title to the side and allow yourself to be a human being, to see individuals for who they are, and also put, put places of programming, just knowing that I'm seeing them, they're in my courtroom, or I'm sitting with them as an attorney, I'm sitting with them right here. And I know in the job, you have to have a job and do things. I ain't trying to say too much, but that may not be. Um, say whatever you want. I just want to word it right, so I'm not offending anyone. You know, like when you have an attorney who's telling someone that they know that killed someone, don't say nothing, let me talk. Mm. When you know they killed that person, mm -hmm. and you're sitting here and you're allowing them to become normal to hurting and hurting and hurting again, that my attorney's gonna get me off, but not being held accountable for the act that they come out and they do kill again and again and again and again. And again. Who's dealing with it? We the world community, right? So sometimes we, I don't know, I just feel like we have to think, it could be you, knock on wood, never wanting that to be. It could be. And when you have people that's trying to really intercede for that, allow it to happen, allow it to be, trust the process. If we want to live this world of peace, harmony, and calm, there's things that we have to do. We all have a role. We hear the um, saying, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to keep our community safe. Mm. It takes a village for us all to come together and really implement changes that need to be abroad for our world to be safe. Because right now, the homicide rate is winning. And it's not okay. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Clarissa. So I'm just going to say a couple of quick things, um, picking up somewhat on what my fellow panelists said. Um, one is that there's an expression, hurt people, hurt people, and healed people, heal people. And so part of what we're trying to do with the restorative justice program that we have is give people the opportunity to heal. We're giving them the opportunity. They can choose the program or not. We're giving them the opportunity within the program to do various things. They can choose those things or not. But it's giving them the opportunity to do these things. Um, uh, and it is true, I think, Clarissa used the expression, doing time. And I think we've all seen people who, that's what they did, they did time. Mm. And that's just whiling away time. But that's not about accountability, that's not facing what you've done, that's not owning what you've done, that's not repairing what you've done. And you can see, I think, that there's no better evidence of empowerment than Clarissa's uh, talk here today. And um, the experience of of being harmed by a crime, of any crime, is the experience of powerlessness. That's what is a central and feature of the experience of being harmed by a crime. And what uh, the restorative justice process gives people, which we don't really afford given the nature of the system, the, um, is it gives them a chance to be empowered. And it, that's why it's appropriately, as Stefan described, victim-centered. And that is an empowering, thing and we think about the needs of the people who've been harmed and that's why even accountability is in a sense victim centered because it's accountable for what you've done to the people you've harmed. So um, in terms of like legal structure and what um, our program, there are three ways that people can come into our program. We started a program that 
Clarissa referred to called RISE in 2015. RISE is a front end program, as I mentioned. Uh, you plead guilty, we defer sentencing for a year, you do various programming, see a magistrate judge once a month, and you do restorative justice. Our restorative justice program is four parts. Part one is a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a facilitator to give you sort of an introduction and an assessment. It's about an hour. Part two is a two-day, 16-hour circle, which is co-led by one of our facilitators. Some of our facilitators are AUSA, some are defense attorneys. Uh, one is our uh, uh, longest serving one is a probation officer. And then the other facilitator who co-leads the circle is a woman that Clarissa referred to, Janet. Uh, Janet also lost her son to murder, and she participated long before the federal court in Boston ever came around to do anything like this. She participated in um, a restorative justice process with some of the people who were responsible for the murder of her son. She's very active in restorative justice. She has co-led almost all the circles that we've done. Um, and then in the circle are the defendants, some other surrogate victims, and sometimes some other people from the system or community members. And that's a two-day, 16-hour process focused on appreciating that the, the crime you did caused harm, what are harms, and begin thinking about accountability and repair, but it's also about trust and empathy. You know, you, the, you can't really expect someone to have empathy for others if they don't have empathy for themselves. And so oftentimes that's part of the process. So I'm not in those circles and we judges get no reports about what happened in those circles. And as I tell my colleagues, I don't really care what happened. I don't really care if someone sat there silently. It doesn't really matter to me. What I wanna know is did the person, are their words and deeds afterwards different? And the word that most comes to mind is aha. And the reason that word comes to mind because that's the word that <clears throat> many individual defendants have used in their allocu allocutions at sentencing who didn't know each other and didn't know about the other person as saying what happened to them in the circle, that there was this aha moment. And what we hope and what I hope and what I've seen in many cases is it's transformed the person's relationship to the system. It's transformed their relationship to themselves and their family. And they've begun to embark on a process of healing themselves, healing and repairing some of the harm that they've done. So that's part two. Part three and four, three is readings or reading group, depending on the circumstances. And part four is an individual apology or repair project designed by the person in conjunction with the facilitator. 90% of the people in RISE who do the, the first two parts, which are required, go on to do the last part. That's the highest rate of uh, compliance that I think the US probation has with just about anything they do. And it's voluntary compliance. Most people aren't volunteering for more federal supervision. Um, so that's the way that we've been, that's the, the program that the restorative justice has been located in along those eight or nine years or so. We've had individual one-off people who come in because of a prosecutor, defense attorney, who the like who do the restorative justice piece. And then um, two years ago or so, um, we, the court approved a pilot program to take the restorative justice, that four-part program, and offer it at one of our detention facilities. We've done that, we've done three cohorts, or th of groups who've gone through that. We're at the tail end of that, and it's been um, subject to the issues that I've alluded to before. It's been quite positive, the experience. And um, we, it's sort of the roundup of all this is that however you do it, and some people I would say also do the restorative justice not as part of our program, but they use CJA funds or federal defender funds to hire a facilitator and go through a process, something like ours, uh, on their own. Um, the, no one gets, we don't promise people anything except that we'll consider all the facts and circumstances. So some people it has a big effect on sentencing and, <clears throat> excuse me, and some people a smaller effect or little effect. It depends on the case and the circumstances. Uh, the bottom line from my perspective is it offers um, that there's more and much more we could do for victims and people who've been harmed. Some of it doesn't require having a program or anything like that. I, have, I'll tell you I have a status conference for people who've been harmed. Anytime there's an identifiable victim, I'll convene a status conference for that person post-conviction pre the sentencing hearing just to explain the process and to explain the range of things that they can ask for because they can certainly ask for prison and they, they don't need me to tell them that. And they can ask for money and they don't really need me to tell them that. But there are a lot of other things they can ask for and they don't really know that. In my experience, they have no idea that there's these other things they could ask for. And that those asking those things doesn't preclude asking for prison or money or anything else they want. And so, and I'll answer their questions, any question they ask. 
Every question can be answered by the judge. Either it can be explained or it can be explained why you can't answer it. Like, I don't know what sentence I'll impose because I haven't read the pre-sentence report. So you can explain that. People are deeply appreciative if you do that because you're being respectful to them and what they've endured. So there's lots of different things. I urge you to think about this and um, to um, do it. Thank you. Great way to end. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but I do know that uh, I think folks are sticking around. Uh, for the day. So uh, I'm, I'm sure we'd all welcome an opportunity to talk with you. And um, I'll just end by saying, I think, you know, the metaphor of a seed, um, a moment, I mean, that is really what this is about. You think about the things that have touched you as a human being in your career or in your life. It often isn't a big speech. It's a moment. It's a seed. It's something that sticks with you. And I think that this, I hope, can kind of offer that inspiration um, for all of you in your practice and work um, as we try to uh, really, you know, re reorient the system toward true justice and safety um, for communities and people. Thank you very much to my panelists, and particularly Clarissa. Thank you so much. Hey, noon, first floor theater, Chairman Carlton Reeves. <laughs>